everyone. Thanks for tuning in to my YouTube channel, Dr. Jess MD. I appreciate all your support and stay tuned for the end of this video. I'm going to answer some of your questions directly from my YouTube channel. So welcome and today we're going to talk about thyroid health. So I usually see most people with low thyroid, better known as hypothyroidism. However, lately I've been getting a lot of questions about people who have increased thyroid hormone or hyperthyroidism. So I'm gonna explain the difference between the two and then give you guys some tips and clues that you may not be getting from your healthcare professionals about how to heal this naturally and what you guys can do to put the power in your own hands to be your own best doctor. So what is hypothyroidism? So hypo means low means you don't have enough thyroid hormone. And the symptoms of this are kind of prominent but also vague. So a lot of people go years without being diagnosed with a sluggish thyroid because the symptoms can overlap with other diseases. So some of the symptoms of low thyroid include things like hard to lose weight or weight gain, constipation, dry hairs and hair and nails, um, dry skin, uh, depression, also cold intolerance. So a great way to self-diagnose low thyroid is to actually take a thermometer and measure your temperature daily. And if your temperature is less than 98 or so, and it's chronically like 96, 97, this means that your thyroid is having a problem. It regulates metabolism, it regulates um, body core temperature. And so if you don't have the thyroid acting properly, you can't regulate your metabolism. This is why you gain weight. This is why uh, you can't regulate your body temperature and have cold intolerance. So if you do have low thyroid or hypothyroidism, you may have come across a doctor who wants to put you on something called Synthroid, or the other name is Levothyroxine. This medicine um, is synthetic. It does have some fillers and preservatives in it, and it's definitely not the best choice for low thyroid. And the reason it's pushed so heavily by doctors is because pharmaceuticals teach doctors. And we have been taught through the system that this is the number one drug, first line of treatment for low thyroid. I'm gonna talk later with you guys about some other options that you can have to treat your low thyroid in a more naturally and holistic way. I'm gonna give you guys some ways later in the video to actually naturally heal your thyroid or ask your healthcare professional for a more natural means or medicine to help do that. Also, what is hyperthyroidism? Okay, so hypo is low, hyper is obviously high, and this means your metabolism is too high, your thyroid is too revved up. And this is a little more rare than low thyroid, but still a problem because the treatment is they give you something called PTU, or methamazole, which actually burns the thyroid out. So the thyroid is going so fast, the only way they treat it is to burn it out and take it away. And then you're stuck on levothyroxine or one of those other medications for low thyroid the rest of your life because you don't have a thyroid anymore. So you can see the system kind of, they do what they can, I guess, but it wouldn't be my first um, way to treat a thyroid problem, to be honest with you. So hyperthyroidism, these people have hot intolerance. They don't like to be in the heat, they sweat quite frequently, they have trouble putting on weight and keeping on weight. They have sometimes have diarrhea or loose stools, anxiety. Um, all these problems indicate a high thyroid and hyperthyroidism is actually much more dangerous than low thyroid if not diagnosed. So these people unfortunately can go into what's known as a thyroid storm, which is dangerous. These people have their heart rate goes up, their blood pressure goes up, and it can be quite dis dis disalarming and scary to the patient. So that's the only one caveat about this video I want to tell you. If you do have a risk for high thyroid, please keep a good monitor on it and have a well-educated healthcare professional that follows you for this. Okay guys, so as you guys know, hypothyroidism or thyroid issues in general are an epidemic in the United States. Almost one in four women over the age of 50 has a thyroid problem. What is this from, right? This is not normal. So hypothyroidism, which is much more common, is caused by a number of multifactorial reasons. One of them is, be, is fluoride in the water. So Iodine is super important for the thyroid. It helps convert T4 to T3, which are the actual thyroid hormones that regulate your metabolism. So without iodine, this conversion can't happen. And people, you would think, are okay in iodine. They put it in iodized salt, table salt, all, that, all these things. But the problem is that there's fluoride in every city water supply. There's also bromide in brominated and enriched breads and pastries. So people are drinking water with extra fluoride in it, they're eating pastries and bread with bromide in it. Both of these elements are found in the same periodic row in the periodic table as iodine. Their 
they're kind of cousins. So when this happens, the fluoride can displace the iodine um, or the bromide can displace the iodine from its respective spot in the thyroid gland and in this conversion. And then people are missing, they're deficient in iodine because the competing cousin elements take over. So this is one reason we have to watch fluoride in our toothpaste, fluoride in our food, medications, it's everywhere. Also, please be careful with bread. Carbs aren't good for anyone nowadays, unfortunately, unless it's vegetables. But things like breads and pastries, we could really cut out because they're very modified nowadays and sprayed with pesticides quite frequently. So there's one other essential element that is as essential as iodine, and they actually go hand in hand. So selenium, many, many people are deficient in selenium. So make sure you're supplementing with selenium in your diet. Look up foods that are rich in selenium as well. Um, what I tell my patients who have Hashimoto's or the autoimmune form of low thyroid or hypothyroidism is that iodine can be a little bit like dousing fuel on the fire, which is a problem with Hashimoto's. So this is a little bit of a controversy within the medical profession. However, in my belief and with my patients, what I've witnessed with my eyes is that if you add iodine with selenium in equal parts in Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you can actually help fix it. So don't just take iodine. If you have Hashimoto's, make sure you're adding equal parts of selenium as well. That brings me to my second point. Pesticides are a big problem with the thyroid as well. And it's not just pesticides, it's also gluten. So I have a patient particularly, I'll give you guys an example. I have a patient right now in clinic who had antibodies to the thyroid. So you know, when you have an autoimmune condition like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, the body supposedly attacks itself or a trigger within the body. It's responding to something there. And this for a lot of people is gluten once there's an autoimmune condition. Gluten and pesticides, which are used a lot in breads and pastries, um, can raise antibodies in our blood. So my patient that I'm talking about has antibodies over a thousand in her blood. The antithyroid peroxidase and antithyroglobulin antibodies are over a thousand in her blood. Usually they should be less than 40. So once we put, got her off gluten, got her on an all organic diet, kept this going on for a few months, her antibodies fell below 100. So it actually is possible for you guys who have Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune condition for the thyroid, to reverse this with proper diet and care and research on your own. I must tell you as a caveat that the medical doctors that you see in this profession will not be able to fix or heal your thyroid. They don't know how. They will give you a medication that treats the thyroid the whole time and puts a band-aid over the, over the problem while not researching the root cause. So please do yourself do justice and do your own research on this topic. So what else can we talk about about thyroid conditions? I'm gonna give you guys some essential elements, minerals, vitamins, and a diet that you need to help regulate this. So obviously I've already said cut out gluten, cut out pesticides, eat an all organic diet. Carbs and refined sugar in general are really detrimental to the thyroid, especially if you're missing nutrients or minerals on the other side. So I talk a lot of times about we, what we do that harms us, then we don't even know it. A lot of times we're missing elements and nutrition. Um, it's not what we're doing, it's what we're missing. So make sure you have the diet that's necessary. Things that are great for iodine um, are kelp, seaweed, all the different chlorella, spirulina, all these things are wonderful for the thyroid. So incorporate these into your diet. Unfortunately, in the standard American diet, we just don't have these readily. So it's up to you to search out the best diet for your thyroid if you have this problem. Be your own best doctor. So no carbs, no sugar. Um, be careful um, with any sort of processed food, guys. And make sure you get enough seaweed and kelp. Super helpful. Some other elements that you will need to have a healthy thyroid are um, magnesium, B12, vitamin D, vitamin A, zinc. Zinc is huge. Zinc is used in like over 300 reactions in the body. It's kind of like magnesium. Zinc helps form hydrochloric acid in the gut. If you don't have hydrochloric acid, you can't break down your food. Uh, you're just not supposed to have it here. But here in the gut, it's essential. So zinc is integral in helping form hydrochloric acid in the gut. It's also integral in forming thyroid hormones. Iodine, as I've already mentioned, is super important. Uh, B12 is super important. So people who have MTHFR or the genetic mutation where they cannot activate B vitamins are really in trouble when it comes to the thyroid. They're at risk. So it's really important for you guys to take methylfolate or methyl B12 to supplement if you have MTHFR. If you don't know what I'm talking about, 
great. That means you probably don't have it. <laughs> or if you do, or think you might, you don't detox well, go ask your doctor for a test. These are things that you guys, I'm putting in your hands to ask, okay? Um, other things that you need to know about the thyroid. Protein is essential. So if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, you are at risk for having a B12 deficiency and you're at risk for hypothyroidism because you have to have essential protein in the diet to form thyroid hormones and to form thyroid stimulating hormone. It's essential. So search out good quality proteins, grass fed, organic, free range. If you're a vegan, make sure you're getting lentils and beans and all these different um, avenues for protein. Be your own best doctor again. Okay, finally, I wanna give you guys a recommendation for if you do unfortunately have a thyroid problem, what can you do? So, a lot of doctors will look at the reference range in labs and say, you're normal, everything's okay. And you as a patient may have thought, gosh, I thought I had thyroid problems, I'm so sluggish and depressed and don't have any energy. Well, that could be a number of different things, but I wanna give you guys an ideal range for thyroid hormones. So. Lab tests have different ranges, so I want you guys to keep this in mind. And the ones I'm going by are Quest and LabCorp, which are the most common of the, th of the testing modules that we use. So for T4, which is one of the thyroid hormones, you want that range to be between about 1.2 and 1.6. This is a more tight range than the normal standard reference range it gives you. I'm giving you an ideal range. So 1.2 to 1.6 on LabCorp or Quest is where you want to be. For T3, I usually say about three to four is the reference range. So if you're in those ideal ranges, your thyroid is in great shape. If not, you can work on it yourself, given the elements that I just gave you to incorporate into your diet, and also the diet changes you need to make as well. Okay, so medicines that you guys can get that is not Synthroid or Levothyroxine. My personal favorite that I had a lot of um, interaction with at Whitaker Wellness was WP or Westall Thi Thyroid. So WP Thyroid is one of the cleanest supplements made. I have to say that a lot of vegans have trouble because they do incorporate um, thyroid hormone from pork a lot of times, so it's very difficult sometimes for vegans to know which thyroid supplement to take. So besides WP Thyroid, I also really love Nature Thyroid and Armor Thyroid. Although I have seen them not work quite as well as WP Thyroid, they are natural and uh, derived from natural sources without fillers and preservatives, so they're actually much better than Synthroid or Levothyroxine for you guys. Um, the other thing that I want to tell you about is that heavy metals can cause a problem with a thyroid too. So any sort of radiation to the neck, to this area of the chest, any sort of heavy metal toxicity can also interfere with the delicate thyroid, which easily, easily goes out or we wouldn't have an epidemic in the US. Finally, I want to let you guys know that any doctor will may maybe will buck or wouldn't like you guys asking about natural supplements. So I always recommend that you guys go search out more of a holistic medical doctor, naturopath, DO, anyone like that that can help you out to give you proper advice about the thyroid because medications are not the answer in this case. The answer is you and your proactivity. Finally guys, last tip I wanna give you besides asking about medication for your doctor, make sure you're getting enough sleep at night. Autoimmune patients don't sleep and it's really important to take some adaptogen herbs. And when I say adaptogen herbs, I mean things like ashwagandha and holy basil or tulsi. These actually give you energy when you need it and make you sleepy when you need rest. Okay, so I wanted to answer a couple questions for you guys today, and I'm just gonna read them right off my phone here. Um, and these two are from the acne and psoriasis video I did a couple weeks ago. So the first one is from Pierogi Lover. And they ask, um, I've been making kombucha and the library book I've rented says that caffeine, the level of caffeine in the black tea stays throughout the fermentation process. Is all caffeine bad? And should I not drink tea or kombucha? I love you, Dr. Jess. Love you too. Okay, so I don't think all caffeine is bad. Caffeine is a drug. We've been told it's not. We're a little brainwashed about it. So if you're not addicted and you use it every now and then for a pick-me-up, there's nothing wrong with it. It's when you're burning the candle at both ends, you're not sleeping enough at night, you're getting up too early and exhausted every morning, and you're using this drug called caffeine to help keep you awake throughout the day. If you're using it because you like the taste, you don't need it to function, you're getting enough sleep at night, you're being self-loving to your body, then kombucha is great. Tea is great. I do the same, so don't feel guilty about that. The second question is from Taylor Lager, 
and I don't know if it's a guy or a girl, but I'll just read it. For a video, can you go into more about diabetes and some holistic approaches? And he or she go on to say that they're a pharmacy tech and they have friends and family members who have this disease and aren't sure about insulin and other medications. So actually, Taylor, I just did a blog post on um, the best supplements for diabetes. I will tell you from personal experience at Whitaker Wellness, we would have patients come in on twice daily dosing of insulin, sometimes 40, 50, 60 units twice a day. And we would regulate their diet, take them all processed foods, sugars, all those things that actually cause diabetes, and put them on more of a paleo type diet with no fillers or preservatives. Then after every meal, we would walk them 50 to 15 to 20 minutes. And guess what? They didn't need insulin. They didn't need insulin. So insulin to me is counterintuitive anyway, because you're giving patients a medicine when they already have too much of it. In type two diabetes anyway, not type one. So type two, they produce too much insulin. The receptors become resistant. They don't take the blood sugar into the cells and it stays in the bloodstream where their blood sugars are super high. So you're giving them a synthetic medicine from pigs that is A, unique to the human body and B, is there's already too much of it in their body. So why is that the answer? It's not, it causes weight gain, it causes a more progressive disease. So the answer is exercise and diet. Um, herbs that help with diabetes, I again, you can refer to the blog post, but things like berberine outperforms metformin, outperforms it. Um, alpha lipoic acid, chromium, vandal, vandal sulfate, um, all these are essential. Cinnamon, cinnamon too. So all these are essential to help with type two diabetes and blood sugars. So as a pharmacy tech, I hope you don't think everything's medication, I don't think you do since you're following me, but you can give your friends and family members some helpful tips, because ultimately they have to be the ones that, want, that care and want to put in the work. So I hope that helps answer your question, Taylor. Anyway guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to leave questions below on this video and I'll get to them next time. Mwah.